we're gonna record. There we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're just gonna go through this script together. Um, so hopefully you all can like sort of split screen and have me on one side and have your R open on the other. Um, where is it? Let's see if my, if I will be able to share my R. What is this? Hold on. It's too quiet. You guys should, oh, we got another one. I'm gonna just change this so that there's like no waiting room. What is happening? Why can't I share R? <laughs> ah! Hello, new, new friends. Let's see. <laughs> Why can't I share this screen? What is happening? So I don't know what I'm gonna do if I can't just share the screen because this is kind of useless if I can't. This is going so well. What? <laughs> I'm gonna die. Okay, hold on, hold on. Everyone should unmute so I don't feel so weird. And then we can all make fun of me for this. Okay. Why? Just why? Okay, I guess we'll just do this. Yes. Can everyone see R? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. That works. If I just share like my whole desktop, I guess that's, this is fine. Um, cool. So let me just change you guys so I can see everyone. Okay, cool. So we're going to start with the very, very basics of R in this session. Um, and we're just going to go through basically how it works. Because when I was an undergrad, um, I had a lot of professors just hand me a script and they said, run it. And so I had used R, but I didn't actually know how it works. So we're gonna go through those very basic details of how to use R so that you know how it works and not just what to type in, right? Because um, the great thing about R is that we can just Google any questions that we have and have someone on the internet knows how to do it. So we can just type in whatever, right? But without knowing how it works, you're not really gonna learn from that. So we'll go through that right now. So first thing is how R is divided up. Um, so, oh, sorry, I have to coordinate with the other people that are doing the other session, sorry. Um, so R has about, has four like major sections. So we have this part that's the script. If you guys don't have that up, what you wanna do is go to this plus sign in the corner and start a new script right here like this. And so that's where you wanna work because that's actually going to save what you're doing. So this part down here in the lower left is the console. So you can do everything in the console that you can do in the script, but it's not gonna save it anywhere. So we wanna do all of our work in the script so we can keep it and save it. And if you wanna do whatever, whatever stuff you wanna do, one plus two, three, you can do that sort of thing in the, in the console. But again, if it's not in the script, it's not gonna save, so it's not really that useful to you. Then in this section, we have the global environment. And so that's gonna be where all of our objects are placed. Um, then down here, we'll have all of our plots and things are gonna show up. We can find our packages here. And then like the help window and all that jazz. Cool, everyone with me? Awesome. Cool. So let's all just try putting anything into your R into your R script. 
So if you put in a number, R knows what the number is. But if you put in anything that's not a number, it doesn't know what it means yet because we have to assign it a value. So then if we assign, we assign values with this little arrow looking guy. And so now if we run that, now R knows what X is. So all we're doing is assigning a name to a value. And so we can see when we assign a name to a value, it'll show up in our global environment over here. So now it means something, right? And I'm just gonna move this over so we can see our, our script. Cool, so now that X means something, we can use it for some analysis, right? So we can say X plus two. So X means one. So now X plus two is three, right? So then there's a lot of different classes of objects in R and everything like an X or whatever is an object and all the objects go in the global environment. So you can find the type of class of our object with the class function. So this is the very beginning of where we're gonna use our functions and our functions just do things to our variables like X. So what we're using right now is called base R. And so these are functions that are already built into R and these are all of your very basic functions that you might use. Now, what you can get in R are packages and packages allow you to use new functions. So did everyone check the class of their object that they created? The class function. And it should just be, if you assigned it a number, it should just be a number or in a numeric. Okay, so next we can also check the structure. So we just have, it's a vector technically of just one value. Okay, now we can make lists in R. And so we're gonna create a list with this little C. I don't know what the C stands for or anything, but going C parentheses means we're gonna make a list and we separate the items in our list with a column, with a column, with a comma. So these are gonna be the values in our list. And we're gonna call that list Y. So now we can see that Y shows up in the global environment. And it's a list of numbers one through five. If anyone has questions while we're going through this, just speak up. I am not a teacher, so I'm not gonna notice if you, if you start looking weird or whatever, just, just speak up if you have a question. Or yeah, so Bethany, I do have a question. So the, the script that you're going off of right now, have you emailed that to us or should we just be creating that on our own on the side? I was oh, gonna have, but I, I, yeah, so I was gonna have everyone just go through it themselves, but if you want it, I can just email it to everyone. No, that's fine. Um, but then I have a, you haven't emailed it and that's fine. That's great. So then I have a question actually, is there some reason why um, I would type X, you know, carrot, you know, assign, assign the value one to that, and then it wouldn't show up in the global environment. That would not make sense. Is yours not showing? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. So, oh, I didn't even go through how to run things. That would be important. <laughs> Sometimes these are, this is where ah. I'm, you have to run things for them to go. <laughs> Sorry, I should have gone through that first. So for something to run, right? Because you can, just type, you can just type up all this stuff. To run it, you wanna go ahead and highlight. And then on a Mac, it's gonna be command enter. Or you can, I got it. you guys, my way, but um, you can hit this little run function. 
thing here, and that will run what you've highlighted. Or if you put your cursor here, it will run up to there. So yes. now it should show up. Sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> These are the sorts of things I don't, yes. I don't think about. Okay. Now did everyone get that to work? Yes. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Okay. So I'm going to make a list. And then here's a new function of sequence. And we can use sequence to make a list of numbers in the sequence and we can tell it by how many. So Z will be a sequence of the numbers one through 10 by two. Cool. Here, I'm actually going to just, um, oh, no, this, is not, this, this works. Okay, so now we have three values in our global environment. We have our X, our Y, and our Z, and Y and Z are lists. So we can do different commands on the items that we have in the global environment. So we can just multiply them. And now it returns in the console, and the console is where a lot of your stuff is going to show up. Just because you're not, um, you're not like doing the coding in there, it doesn't mean it's useless, right? All of your things that you tell R to do are going to show up in the console. Not all the things; a lot of the things are going to show up in the console. So now we can take z times y. Okay, hold on, wait, back up a second. We just did that, but we didn't name it anything. So if we don't name it anything, R is not going to save it. So just running this, it, it doesn't really mean anything to R, it just did it. If we want to save that, we want to assign it a value. So if we call A Z times Y, now it knows what Z times Y is and we can use that in the future. So then I'm gonna try, I'm gonna run B, which is Z times y, or Z plus Y. And notice now when we named it, it didn't show up in the console. If I now type just B in the console, it will show me what B is. But if I just name, if I name B to Z plus Y, it has just named it and it hasn't actually shown me anything. And we can try adding two different lengths together. So this will just repeat X. X was just one, so now it's just adding um, Z plus X and it's just repeated X. So that works if, because X is not a list, it's just the number. So it's just gonna add, yes. Um, how important are the spaces? I haven't really played around with that, but is there any Rule there, or is it just kind of preference? Yeah, that doesn't matter. That's all preference. Okay. Oh, I should have gone through comments too. Where, where's my brain? To comment something out means that it's not going to run, right? And so you put uh, the pound symbol first and then type your things. And so if you'll notice, like right here, I have, I continued my comment onto the next line. I still have to put the pound sign first. And in R, there is no like end comment. It's just going to continue for the rest of the line. So if I put a comment in, one line, if I comment here and then want to still do a function, I can't do that. I have to go to the next line. Thank you for your questions, by the way, because these are like I learned R so long of like, like four years ago. So I, these aren't the sorts of things that I think about needing to teach someone. So that this is really good to, <laughs> to have the questions. Okay, so if I create a list of just two numbers, and then try to add them together. This isn't going to work because we're adding together two lists. It doesn't know what to do with it. 
So there's other functions we can do to repeat the list, but we're not gonna go over that right now because it's not that important. You're not ever gonna use this in data analysis, right? I'm just showing you how it works basically. Cool. I don't think we actually get to, to it later, despite what the script says, by the way, but it's fun. Okay, so now we're gonna go through our comparisons, which are really, really useful. And so they're going to return a logical class, which is also known as a Boolean and other sorts of coding things. And that just means true or false. So if we say one equals equals two, false, right? So that'll just return these things to us in the console is true or false. And in R, you need to remember that it's two equal signs to say like, is it equal? To say not equal, we use an exclamation point. Y not equals to Y, it's gonna say false because remember Y was a list. So it's gonna return the logical class for each comparison. So because Y is equal to Y, it's gonna return false. And then we can compare it across this list. And this one is a little bit more interesting. True, false, false, false. Cool. Is this making sense for everyone so far? Everyone with me still? I'm just going to give you guys a second to, to catch up while I plug in my laptop. everyone all caught up and ready to move on? Cool. Okay, so we're going to make a data frame out of our lists. Um, and so a data frame is a list of lists. So just like if we imagine a regular data table, our list is the columns in the list, and each column is itself a list. So we can make a data frame with the function data.frame. And one thing that does matter, spaces don't matter, but capitalization does matter. So capital X is different than lowercase x. And data dot frame with a little f is different than data dot frame with a big f. So we're going to create our data frame out of these lists and we're going to name it df. If we don't name it df, R just did it and it didn't save it. So we run df equals data dot frame of all of our lists. And so now we have a data frame comprised of the list that we just made. And we can just open it by, by clicking it in the global environment. That's not gonna happen when you, when you just have uh, lists and things in there, but when you have a data frame, you can open it. It will actually show you something. Cool, then we can check the type. It's a list because a data frame is just a list made of lists. And then we have its structure and it will show us, um, these are all the different columns and then all of the different values in the columns. And I will go ahead and like, I'll email this out to everyone after the fact, so you have it, I guess. Probably should have sent it beforehand, but it's it's commented enough that it should hopefully make sense. And like I said, I just want you guys to understand how it works so that you can Google any of your questions that you have when you're actually working with this stuff, so. And did you say, Bethany, what STR stands for, where it comes from? Structure. Structure, thank you. Yeah, so some of them make sense. Not all of them make sense. I think you can go question mark STR. I think that's how, oh, that was Stringer, oops. Um, if you go into the little help 
thing in here, you can just search any of the things that you're using and it will give you some. Uh, Great, thank nice you. Time. It will explain it to you and you can do that without the internet, which is lovely. Um, cool, so now we're gonna do the fun part. At least I think it's fun. That's what I do every day of my life. So R has some built-in data sets that we're gonna get to play with, which are pretty cool. So if you guys just run data, then parentheses of nothing, it will come up with this neat little thing that has all of these different data sets that you can just pull straight out of R. They're already built in. You don't have to download anything and you can just play with them all you want and practice your R skills. So you can just like take a look at those real fast. Um, there's a lot of them, but we're gonna use this one called tooth growth. So if everyone can run this, which is data quotes, tooth growth, so it knows which package it is. And again, this is where it matters. We don't want any spaces and we want the same capitalization because otherwise it's not gonna know what it is. And then this is a special case where we don't have to name it just because it is a built-in package. In every other case, you're going to have to name your data. I had a lot of times of like putting in the read function. So it reads in my data set and being like, where's my data set? So you, have to save, you have to save it to a value. Otherwise it just did it, just read it in, but it didn't keep it in the global environment. So read in tooth growth. And then in your global environment, it will have this little promise thing. I don't know what that's about, but you have to click it and then it will actually show up. Okay, and did everyone get that to work? And so with these data sets that are in R already, um, how would you find out what's there? Is there any sort of meta file? All we have is this, when you just run the data set thing and then this pulls up and then we can see what, what it is. Um, I do know something about the one we're using, but you can just Google these and like, Okay. people know stuff you can you can find them on the internet but it just gives you like this little little blurb about what they are so we have like so this tooth growth data set if i click on it so what it is is they took guinea pigs and they fed them vitamin c or orange juice and then they measured their teeth so it's like the tooth length the supplement they were given and the dose um so that's, that's all I know about, about this one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can use this function called head and that lets us look at the first few lines of our data. And that's good to just take a look at what, we're, at what our data looks like. And if we're, run, if we're reading in a data set, um, just to make sure it was read in correctly. Because sometimes I'll be working with data sets that have like hundreds of variables and thousands of observations. If I just clicked on it to look at it, it's going to take me 8 million years, first of, it, first of all, for it to load. And then also for me to check if it actually went in right. But, so that's that one. And then you can alternatively use tail to look at the last few lines of your data. This is not useful. It's just to look at the data, <laughs> just the first few lines. Not that useful for us right now. Okay, this next part is pretty important. So to target a specific column within our data frame, we use the little dollar sign. So first, this is our data frame that we're using, tooth growth, dollar sign to specify the column, and then len is our length, the like guinea pig teeth. So if I run that, it gives me a big long list of all of the different, of the entire length column. So I've just targeted the one column in the data frame. Cool. 
So now we're going to go ahead and rename the columns. And there's about a million and a half different ways to rename your columns, but I'm going to show you guys this one. And so because this is a built in R function. So it's just call names. And we run call names on tooth growth. Right, so that means this is the function we're doing and we're doing it on this data frame. And we're assigning those a new list. And this new list is gonna be our new column names. So I like to use the actual, the actual word instead of len, I like to say length. That's just my preference of how to keep all the variables straight in my brain. So we're gonna just rename the column names of our data frame. Are there restrictions on what our names can be like? Do they always have to start with a capital or a letter or? No, so that's um, pretty important. They can't start with a number. Um, sometimes I will have column names that when I'm just, when I'm loading them in, they start with a number. And so I just have to go with a tick like this. And then I can say, like I have this stupid data set that's like age distributions and it will be like five to 10. So I have to go tick five to 10 so that I can rename it something else really fast because doing this is very irritating, but um, like that. And then the other thing you wanna be careful of is naming your things, stuff that is already a function. So um, I think length is one of them. Yeah, so if I start typing length, first of all, or will give me suggestions, which is great. But you see this little blue rectangle? That means it's a function. So I don't want to name anything length with a lowercase l and then click this because now it's a function. Whereas if I went um, tooth growth, so first it will give me the suggestion for this data frame and then length with a purple rectangle, that means it's an object. So that's fine but I wouldn't want to name anything length and then click the little, this blue rectangle suggestion because then it's a function and it's, it's going to try to do a function. It's not going to know what the, what the thing I'm looking for is. So that's important because I had this one intro to our class where I was trying to like name my variable, like say length and my professor could not figure out why it was not running. And it's because it was reading it in as a function, not a variable. So that's the one thing that I will say is really important that you don't do is don't name it the same thing as a function that, that exists. Okay, cool. So we're gonna look at some summary statistics now, which is I think the more important reason we're here, right? So, um, and we can just do that with summary. And so if I only want summary statistics on length, then I need to specify my data frame, dollar sign, then the column. So now I'll only get summary statistics for the length variable. And so this is lovely. Minimum, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, and maximum. The only thing this is missing is standard deviation. So standard deviation is SD and I can run SD on that same variable and get the standard deviation. Is everybody good? Cool. I'm gonna move on now and there will be a second for you guys to catch up with, with this part. So we're gonna load in our first library or, okay, I keep, I said this before on my practice run, but our first package with the function library. Um, 
well, you guys aren't going to use library. You guys are going to go to packages and then click install right here and search for dplyr and then hit install. And so this package gives us access to new functions that are going to make our lives a lot easier. So you'll just have to go through and install dplyr. Um, it'll just take a minute. And then you will only ever have to do that once. And then for your new R scripts, um, what you want to do is library and then the name of the package you're using and that will tell R to use it. So it'll, you can instead go into your packages and click the ones you're going to use. Um, but for someone like me that uses 80 million packages, um, I want to use library to specify the package I'm using. And then it's considered good data analysis to only load in your packages right before you're going to use them for the first time. So I have some professors who will just load in a list of 20 different packages at the beginning of their R script and they'll do that every single time and they have no idea which functions come from which package. That is bad data analysis. You don't want to do that because you don't want to make everyone download every single package ever um, before you share your script with them or whatever. Um, so always only load in your package right before you're going to use it. So that way you keep straight in your brain uh, which functions come from which packages. Do you go over to how to install library dplyr one more time? I'm not getting like a little pop up. Yeah. So, at all. Yeah. So if you go over to this area here, go to packages, click the packages tab, then go to install, and then dplyr, click it, and then install. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it should look crazy in the console for a second, and then it should say the very end, like package installed in something. And a lot of people write really cool packages for all sorts of different, like really niche sorts of things. Like I know there's like hydrology packages and stuff that people use. I don't know all of those, but you can basically find a specific package to do a lot of very specific things. And that's the great thing about R is that it's open source and it's free. And so people write all these packages to do all sorts of really cool stuff. And then you can just load them in for free and use them. And, and it's all great and awesome. Cool, did everyone get dplyr loaded in? Yeah, cool. Okay, so this little guy here is called a pipe. And the pipe lets us pass our variables from one line to the next. And I know that doesn't sound that useful, but trust me, it is very useful. So we're gonna create um, a new data frame that is just for the guinea pigs that were treated with orange juice. So we're going to use the dplyr function called filter to select only the guinea pigs that were treated with type OJ. So I'm going to go through this again really, really slowly. So new data frame. We're going to call it OJ guinea pigs. We're going to point to it so that R knows what it is, so it'll save it using our old data frame, tooth growth. We're going to pipe tooth growth to the next line, which is filter. And we're gonna say we only want the lines in our data frame for which the type is OJ. And remember again, we use two equal signs to say, is it equal to? And then if it's yes, it will save it to this new data frame called OJ guineas. Okay, did that make sense? Okay, cool. So dplyr has eight actions. Mutate, filter, sort, slice, arrange, select, rename, and summarize. The only one that doesn't make sense, intuitive sense as to what it's doing is mutate, and that's probably the one I use most often. And what mutate does is it makes a new column. And so this is pretty useful. I think if there's an example later on in the script, um, but I use that to say like, 
if I have um, a column of population and I wanna make population in millions, I'll just go mutate. Population divided by a million is population in millions, something like that. But that's all that mutate does is it creates a new column. But the rest of these are pretty intuitive. So uh, yeah, yeah, they're intuitive. They make sense, right? Um, so did everyone get their new data frame filtered only for type equals OJ? Or you don't have to, you can just follow along, that's fine. But as long as that makes sense for everyone. Cool. So now we're gonna plot our data. And so we're gonna need a new function, package, package. We're gonna need a new package called ggplot2. And this is sort of the gold standard of plotting and data visualization. Um, so if everyone can go through the same process of just hitting install packages ggplot2 and install that. And ggplot2 is really, really helpful. Um, basically everyone does their data visualization in ggplot. Um, I think ggplot also exists for Python, so that's pretty cool too. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. And because everyone uses it, there's a lot of answers for any of your questions on Google. So again, just go through your installing ggplot2. That one will probably take a little bit longer than dplyr did. Um, and then we'll go through how to create this plot. Cool, so we'll go through the plot now. So what ggplot does is it works in layers and we're gonna add each layer to the next layer with a little plus sign. So for our first line, we're just gonna go ggplot, then we're gonna specify the data. And you can put, I don't really put this in ever, but you can say data equals. And I think that's really helpful for just remembering in what order you need to put in your things. Not all of, for not all of the, the functions does the order matter, but it's helpful to keep it straight. Um, and then we specify our X and our Y variables with the aesthetics. And I don't know exactly what aesthetics does, not gonna lie, but that's where we put our X and our Y. And then we're gonna specify, okay, wait, well, let's go back here. So what we're gonna plot, I'm just gonna run this just so that you guys can see what we're going to be plotting. Okay, can you guys see that with it? Hold on, it's loading. Can you guys see the big plot? Yeah, cool. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be plotting and it's just a bar graph of the two different treatment types and then the, the tooth length. So that's what we're gonna be plotting here. So hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense for as I'm going through this. Um, so for our X, we need the type, which is the, the treatment type, the orange juice or the vitamin C. Um, and then our Y is the length and then we're gonna fill, which is just the color of the bar plots based on type. And it'll just automatically assign those colors, but we're gonna tell R that the colors we want depend on the type. So it's gonna have a, a different color for each type. Okay, so that's just the, the first layer. The next layer we need to do is specify the type of plot we're gonna make. So we're gonna make a bar plot so we say geom bar, and there's all sorts of types of geom. If I just uh, go geom underscore, oh, of course I won't, oh, because I spelled geom wrong. There's all sorts of types of geoms. So you can, this is telling R what kind of plot you wanna make. And there's about a million and a half of them. 
but for right now we're going to make a bar plot since we have categorical data. And then the other thing I'm going to do is say stat equals identity. I don't know why it's like this, but this is how we say that our y variable means something. Um, because normally in a histogram we have our x variable and then the count of how many observations is our y. This is just telling it that we have a y variable. Okay, and then the next layer, well, the next two layers don't really matter that much. They're just to make it pretty. Um, um, and so I go labs for labels, and then I specify just the title because our X and our Y are already, um, I've already named them so that they make sense. And then I put theme classic because I think it looks nice. So everyone can go ahead and run that. Hopefully that'll work. And then all of your plots are gonna show up over in this quadrant in the little plots function area. Did everyone get theirs to work or do we need a second? And it's, it tends to be really helpful if someone's doesn't work so that we can look at what's going on. Yes. Mine doesn't work. Okay. Do you want to share your screen and we'll... Uh, sure. Let me, let me go to how I do that. Let's see. Stop sharing. And then I'm going to let you share your screen. All right. Cool. So this is the error I'm getting. I tried ggplot too because I wasn't sure if that was an issue. But yeah, ggplot's not working either right here. OK, so did you install the package first? Yeah, where was that? That was up here. I don't know. Yeah, and if I could not find. Um, if you scroll down in your list of packages to ggplot2. Yeah, so to install ggplot2. Okay, so you installed it already. Yeah, try again. Let's see if it says that it's already installed. Okay, then just run that library ggplot2 line. Okay. Is it thinking or? Oh, no, I went, you're good. Okay. Oh, okay. And then now try doing the rest. Oh, there you go. Like. I think maybe it just didn't, you probably just needed to run that library line. What is the point of the library line? I don't think that ran last time. Okay, that's just to tell R that you're using the package. I do find it irritating <laughs> because like you've already downloaded it. Hmm. And now it's just like, okay, let me use it now. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and yeah, uh -huh. now I can share R all of a sudden. That's okay. Cool. <laughs> so that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So we're good. Everyone got their things to run. So I have my spiel about that's why ggplot is awesome. And what I've been getting into lately is making animated plots using ggplot, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it's really flexible. You can do a lot of stuff with it. You can basically recreate any sort of plot you ever need to do and everyone uses it. So any question you have is on the internet, ready to be Googled. Um, it's always great to go to Stack Overflow if you've ever heard of that. And that's a great place to find answers for all of your R questions. Okay, now we're gonna play with a time series plot, which is gonna be extra fun. And this is gonna be another, um, another built-in package in R. So we're gonna, now we're gonna use the uh, package called Lubridate, which is, I'm taking a time series class right now, so I use this all the time, but it's, they have some cute little description where it's like, 
it's dates, but for humans or something. I don't know, it's super cute. Um, so we're gonna do the same thing again, where we're gonna install Luberdate. And then we're gonna use that for exactly one function, but it's good to have, and it lets us convert our dates into different, into different, into different types of dates. And so all the packages that I've shown you guys today are part of what's known as the tidyverse. So you can instead just download tidyverse, but it's going to be a lot bigger. It's going to have a lot more different packages in it, but um, those are the pretty standard packages that most people are using in R. Cool. So if everyone has Luberdate, super awesome. We're going to do just what we did with the guinea pig data, but we're going to uh, do Nile instead. And so this is just flows from the Nile. And we're gonna have to do the exact same thing again, hit this little promise thingy. Um, and we have a time series object now. And that's just a special, a special type of object in R. It's just a data frame, um, except what's really irritating about this is that um, it's just giving me a list. So it has the date embedded in it, but it doesn't show me because it's a time series object that has a start and an end and a frequency. And then it has all, it just has a giant list of values and it doesn't actually show me the date. And I hate this type of object so much. So we're gonna convert the time series object into a data frame. So if everyone gets their, their Nile ready, we'll do that to it and make it easier to, to work with. Hi, you have a question? Oh, bye, okay, bye. Um, cool, so we're gonna go and extract the time from Nile. We're gonna, we're gonna pull out the date. Cool, we have a date and we're saving it to, to the value date. Cool, so now it shows up in the global environment. And now we just have date in our flows. So we're gonna create a data frame out of the flows and the date. And all we have to do is do what we did before in our little example and create a new data frame called df underscore Nile. That's our new object. And we're running the function data frame to create a data frame from our two lists. And if we run that, now we have an actual data frame. And now if I click on it, it's an actual data frame with a date and a value. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we're gonna plot it now that we have our data. And so again, we're gonna use ggplot because it's wonderful. First line, we're just gonna specify our, um, our data frame. Then we're gonna tell it what type of plot to make. In this case, we're gonna make a line plot. So geom underscore line. And then we're gonna use AES aesthetics to specify our X and our Y variables. So we're gonna go date on the X and the flows on the Y. So now we just have this lovely little thing. And then I'm me, so I, it was a theme underscore classic so that it doesn't have this gray background, which I find really irritating. So now it has white background, cool. 
So I'm getting an error in getting the data from the Uber date. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and have you share because you should not be getting your data from Lubridate. Okay. Cool. So that looks right to me. Let's start with data Nile and just load that one line in. Just, just the one line. Your line 83, perfect. Just run that. Okay, click your little promise thingy in there. Okay, I think that's maybe what the issue is. Yeah, because it needs to have the data in there first. And with a little promise that, I don't know, I don't know, it's just like a weird thing about the built-in functions, but you have to like click it for it to actually like load in. Um, and then go ahead and run the rest of that. And like, let's just make sure that it works. And if you just run a whole big chunk, it will just go line by line and, and do it all in order. Like it's it's not a big deal to do it like that. Okay. But I just usually go line by line just to make sure that everything's working. Yeah, I think, so you always have to run this line that's just data and then the name first. Yeah, so that's just because we're using a built-in function, which is kind of irritating, but um, we do need to make sure that our data frame is loaded in before okay. we do anything else. So I'll go back to sharing my screen then. Cool. So we have that. Now we'll go ahead and, and we're almost done by the way, just five more minutes here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and add, oh man, I have a plot lane in here, okay. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and add a line for our average flow. So one of the things that we can get, um, with just like statistical things is find the mean. So we're gonna run the function mean to find the mean on our data frame Nile. And then we're gonna specify just the column Nile to find the mean. And now that we know what it is, we're gonna put it into our code of plot. So the first two lines are the same and now, like I said, ggplot uses layers. So we're gonna layer on another, another plot on top of it, basically. Um, and then this layer is going to be the line for the average flow. So the average flow we, we found was 919.35. So we're gonna go AES, our X is our date still, our Y is our average flow, 919. Um, and then we're going to specify some just some fun things in here. We're going to make it dashed with the function line type. And then we're going to color it purple for fun. And then for our labels, we can specify the labels on the X axis, the Y axis, and the title. And then again, I'm going to go theme classic because I don't want gray backgrounds. And then we will have a pretty little plot.
Did you guys get it to run? I just get a an output of null. What is the error that it gave you? Um. Oh, an unexpected parentheses. Okay, I probably just yeah. There you go. That's one of the other irritating things that you'll get in there. They should be if you have like a a weird. If you have too many parentheses, it will like squiggly underscore it or whatever. Um, so that's a little bit useful. Yeah, these are the sorts of things that I very much remember from back in the day of being like, why will my code run? And it's because you've got an extra parentheses or something in there. And again, you can Google your errors. Just copy and paste your error into Google and you, everyone has these errors all the time. So that's, again, for the millionth time, this is the great thing about R is that if you have a problem, you can Google it and I guarantee it will be somewhere on the internet. What are these errors that we're getting, even though we're getting the output, like your orange text down there? I get the same thing. It's yeah. Uh, let's see. Don't know how to automatically pick scale for object type time series, default and continuous. So it's just because it's a time series, our x value is a time series. So they're not actually a continuous thing because it's like it, it's years. So they're not continuous, they are discrete. So it's just, it's connecting them. It's connecting the dots basically, okay. as opposed to having like one through a hundred on the x-axis and then it just connects them. Um, yeah, okay. Just yeah, kind of just like your time series object thing. And I hate time series objects, but that's okay. So cool. Does, I'm gonna stop sharing. Does anyone have any other questions? I'm actually gonna show you one more thing because <laughs> Um, if, if anyone doesn't mind, is everyone cool to hang out for like five more minutes? Yeah. Okay, cool. We're going to learn some more stuff. Just like a quick, some more stuff. So one thing that you're going to want to do is set your working directory and your working directory means the file on your computer that you're working out of. So all I'm going to do is go to, I don't think you guys can actually see this part, but if I go to session at the very top of my screen, then set working directory, and then to choose directory, I can choose which file I'm working out of. And then that's where I can find all of my data for what I'm working on. And it will also automatically save to that same file. So if I'm working on a certain project, I will just create a file on my computer and then I will set the working directory to that file. And then I have all of my data coming out of there and then I have all of my code going back in. So that's one thing that you wanna do when you're working with actual data. Another thing is just to read in your data sets, um, read.csv or read Excel or whatever. And that's how you're going to read in your data sets that you're actually going to be working with. And again, remember, because we had built in functions, we didn't have to save them to anything, but you're always going to want to name your data, whatever your data is, read.csv, and then whatever your data, whatever it's named as. And that's how you're going to load in your data set. And remember to put your and that's how we load in data sets instead of working your arcade so that everything comes out and goes back in to there. Cool. Again, I am Bethany. You can email me if you need assistance with R. I'm really good at R. Really good. I'm pretty good at art. Um, so yeah, and then I'm going to, so we recorded this and I'm going to post this somewhere on the internet and then I'll send out another email and be like, oh, here's where it is. So cool. Any last minute questions? You're muted. Oh, I was just saying thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks, Bethany. No Bye. Problem.